As we've traveled through another week of level three restrictions, I find myself giving thanks for the small things in life. Well, for springtime, my garden that's had more care and attention than it has had for years, and for the precious interactions I've had with people, either by phone or across car parks or via Zoom. No matter where we find ourselves, God can still bring a heavenly appointment for us to share into someone's life. Well, Within the church family, we acknowledge the passing of Joan Ward this week, and we lift Terry and the family to God in prayer. The Close family had an intimate graveside service on Thursday, and they're planning to hold a memorial service when conditions allow. Plans are underway for Brian Crum's commissioning service on Sunday the 21st of November, God willing. The plans will evolve as we learn more of what we can and what we can't do in terms of numbers are congregating together. So stay tuned for updates as we get closer to that date. Today we're talking to Donna Langendam about her experience on the Alpha course. Hi Donna, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you Chris. Fantastic. Tell me a little bit about how the course actually impacted you and how, how it resonates with you now. One of the things that I thought of the Alpha course is that it would be all newbies to Christianity like I am and that certainly wasn't the case. I was probably the newest one where the others had been walking the walk for a long, long time. When we first did the introductions, I sort of thought, you know, these new ones getting ready to come, they're all going to have different questions because some of them might need convincing. I was already sort of convinced that this is what I'd, I wanted. They might ask the real hardcore questions for evidence. I thought, oh, that might challenge my belief, but that's okay because I'll get I'll get the answers too. Then these people, they, they had questions, different questions, different experiences, so they could answer my questions. It's a safe environment to do the course and ask the questions, any questions. There's no such thing as a silly question. You're treated with respect and you're not made to feel ridiculous. Oh, well, it's really wonderful to hear about your experience and thank yeah. you for taking the time to share with us. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you, Donna. So, Chris, when's the next Alpha course? So the next Alpha course is going to be run next year, but before we can do that, we need people. We need people to um, host the course. We have up to 12 people on a course or in a group, and two of those are the hosts. Um, two of those are support, and the rest of the people on that team are participants. Um, we also need people to cook for the people that are attending the course. And the biggest request, of course, as well, is for the church to pray. Great. If you're not interested yet, check out this. I lived a fairly good life. I have my own business, have all the toys. I've done lots of things. I had got to a point in my life where I thought it was pretty good, but there was just something missing. I was always looking for the next thing. I was just miserable and there was no reason for it. And I thought, well, the only thing that I can do is look around at the people that I believe are truly happy. I looked at their lives and realized that these people are Christians and I just rolled my eyes and thought, oh, I'm not going there. That's really for people who are really struggling with the world. I wasn't there yet. A friend of mine, I'd known him for a long time. He had been going through a bit of a tough time. We caught up every now and then, and I noticed that he'd changed. And I said to him, why are you so happy these days? And he says, I've become a Christian. And I went, oh no, no, another one bites the dust. That same friend, about a month later, invited me to a coffee group. He said, look, I'll buy you a coffee, come along, meet everybody and then you know you can go when you feel like it and i said to him i'm drinking my coffee and then i'm going he says look just watch the video and then you can go she had started running the video the very first part of it was does jesus exist they completely laid out all of the academic material the evidence 
for Jesus. And I was hooked. I watched the video. We went round the group and they asked what everybody thought of it. And the coordinator said, what did you think? And I sat there and I said, I need to watch it again. And she said, why? And I said, because I think I've got something wrong. I watched it every day for the rest of the week. I went back the next Tuesday. By this stage, I was sort of becoming quite interested in the whole program. And I had been dwelling on this how to pray thing. So I thought I'd give it a go. And this is how it went. Hi, it's me. And I guess you know that. Um, I was just thinking I'd been attending these Alpha courses and they say that you love me, but I have to say, I don't feel it. I just don't feel it. Um, so I'll leave it with you. Um, in Jesus we pray, amen. The next day, I'm a bit of a runner, put on my gear and went off for my run. And I had the same playlist that I had listened to for months. It was about the third song in and I'm going, hang on a minute, this, this is not right. <laughs> and every song that I'd heard, an absolutely beautiful love song. I was just completely overwhelmed and I burst into tears because I knew that he'd heard me, he'd listened, and he told me he loved me. I finished the Alpha course. About a month after I'd finished the Alpha program, I was baptized. Sing high.
So if you got to Sunday school early enough on a Sunday morning, you got to pick the color chair you sat in. And as a young boy, there's no way I was going to sit on a pink chair. There's a red chair, there's a blue chair, there's a green chair, pink, yellow, white. You never sat on the white one, that always looked kind of dirty. So you got your parents to get you there early. Because as a guy, blue for sure, red if you have to, green's okay. The other chair is not a chance. You sit down, and as you sat down, I remember sitting down and having the Sunday school teacher just bring the whole story of the Bible to life on a flannel graph. Remember the flannel graphs? You'd have a flannel graph up there. There'd be the same, it's the same scene for every story. There's hills and there's some grass and, and, and that's it. And then the same figure would be put on the flannel graph to be every single character of the Bible. You put a figure up, add some uh, tablets and a staff, and now it's Moses. Add a sling, and now it's David. And it was the same figure for every story, different little accessories, and you're okay, except Jesus. Jesus, my little Baptist church that I grew up in, they splashed out for the Jesus multi-pack. And you would get every figure you could think of. Jesus praying, Jesus kneeling, Jesus walking, Jesus spreading out on a boat and telling the waves to be quiet. And you would bring this out and, and you would have all these positions. And then at the end of seeing this story come alive on a flannel graph, there was always the coloring activity. And the picture was always of Jesus holding a lamb. And there'd be two other lambs at his feet, and you would get those lambs. Now, the good kids, the, the good Sunday school kids, they would always, you know, color inside the lines and make it nice and pretty. They always left the sheep white, but not me and my friends. This was a chance to be creative, right? So you would put lightning bolts on the side of the lamb and stripes and flames coming out of their back end. And that was the best part of Sunday school. And you would do this. And, and from my earliest days... A lamb cuddling, soft as felt Jesus was God. But here's the problem. That Jesus is left in Sunday school. That Jesus, uh, there was an advanced class later on in my church that said, okay, wait, wait, Brian, hold on a second, because we only gave you one picture of Jesus. There's another Jesus that's a more strong Jesus, a more powerful Jesus, a, a, a more a bigger Jesus than that. I never had that Sunday school. But in Sunday school, a soft felt Jesus was pretty much all you needed, right? Because my problems weren't that big. The problems were as big as somebody cut in front of line or, or Sally over there got a bigger piece of apple during snack time than I did. And that soft, cuddly Jesus could handle those problems. A lamb holding Jesus could deal with that. But I didn't stay in good church. I didn't stay in Sunday school. And neither did my problems. And as you get older, you soon find out that all of our problems get bigger. Sometimes later in life, our problems become social. They become financial. They become sexual. They become relational. Problems become political. They become family. They become about your identity and your self-worth. And we all need a bigger God than the Sunday school Jesus to deal with that. So this morning, what I'm asking us to do is discover, you know, the treasure hunt. I want us to discover the other Jesus, a Jesus way beyond the flannel graph. Because when you think of Jesus, and you think of that guy giving those little lambs a cuddle, well, it's time for us to discover so much more. Philippians 2 highlights that for us. Philippians 2, read it when you can, read it when you can. But it's an incredible chapter that explains who Jesus was before the manger, before old little town of Bethlehem, that he was God. But he didn't consider himself, uh, consider equality of God something to protect and something to hang on to. So he set aside his godness and he came to earth. And choosing the form and the function of a human, he came and he lived among us, Philippians 2 highlights, to walk among us, to show us how to walk with God and not hide from him, to show us how to walk with others and not fight with them. This was a 33-year addition, Jesus, though. This was a limited addition. This was the collector's item. The 33-year limited edition Jesus. We're shown what he's like in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're shown this 33-year limited edition Jesus. There's a manger scene, and we get a story about him being a little boy and getting lost in the markets. Uh, we read other stories of him after he turns 30, though. And there's stories that are 
amazing, miraculous stories. Uh, stories about when Jesus can walk on water. A Jesus with, with a word can calm the seas and calm the storm. With a word can raise a person from the dead. We read that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And John says, this is the guy. This is the guy that I was talking about. I'm not worthy to untie this guy's sandals. This is the guy. And when Jesus comes out of the water, heavens open up and the voice of God is heard by all. This is my son whom I love. And people are like, really? Is this the guy? I keep reading about this limited Jesus that when Jesus would walk in the room, the demons would see him and they would scream from within people. We know you are the son of God. Don't torture us. And it's Jesus that when he's speaking at a home that is so packed, nobody else can get in. Yet some friends who wanted to see their, their best friend healed digs a hole in the roof, drops their buddy down to the ground. And Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. And everyone freaks out. The religious leaders are shocked. No one can mess with that. No one can forgive sins like that. That is Yahweh's territory. So Jesus looks at them and he says, well, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to tell this paralyzed guy to get up and walk? Well, of course, it's a whole lot easier to tell somebody your sins are forgiven because, you know, who can tell the difference, right? But just so that you'll know that I am the son of man and I have power to forgive sins, pick up your mat and walk. So that you know, so that you can know that I am the Son of Man, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Get up, walk. Have you ever thought how weird it is that Jesus keeps talking about himself in third person? As you read Bible stories, he constantly refers to himself as in the third person. Do you know anybody who does that? Who does that? Who talks about themselves in third person? Well, the other day, Brian Crum went to a cafe, and Brian Crum owned a cafe. Who does that? Who does that? Well, the son of Keith was on his way to the beach. Wait, wait, isn't your father named Keith? Why do you keep calling yourself the son of Keith? I am thus the son of Keith. Who does that? That's weird, right? No one talks like that. Why would you do that? 83 times Jesus does that. 83 times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 83 different times Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. That the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. The Son of Man. Now, in Jewish land, with Jewish people, in Jewish terms, he's letting everybody know that he is much more than that soft as felt, lamb cuddling Messiah. See, the phrase son of man, it comes from the book of Daniel. See, now, book of Daniel, that was the awesome Sundays to show up to for Sunday school, right? Those were the best flannel graph stories, right? Daniel in the lion's den and sitting in Sunday school, they put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the roaring furnace. And our church didn't buy the flames, so you could tell the Sunday school teacher kind of made them out of cardboard paper and stuck that on them. They kept falling off, but it was okay because this is cool. They're in fire and they're not burning. Those were the great flannel graph stories, right? Here's my goal this morning. We're going to walk out going, this is so cool. Because I see who I am, and I see just how big, just how powerful God is. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel's given a dream. He sees a vision of God's throne room. He can't see God. He just sees this kind of bright, piercing light. And he refers to God as the Ancient of Days. And in his vision, this is what he says in verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and all peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed." See, Daniel is writing at a time when the Jewish nation is being overrun by the Babylonians. He's in captivity and he's trying to give his people hope. Don't give up. God doesn't lose. Don't give up. God is in charge. Don't give up. His kingdom is not destroyed. So God says, let my people know 
that my son will come. Let my people know that his power will reign and his reign will never end. So when Jesus shows up as a human, he likes the way they spoke about him back in the book of Daniel. He likes the title that everyone has been waiting for. So 83 different times he says, I'm that Jesus. I'm the son of God that comes in the clouds, who has dominion and power and rule, whose kingdom is without boundaries and without end. And every person and every nation of every tribe falls underneath this kingdom. I like the way they spoke about me back then, Jesus says. So every time Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, 83 different times the Son of Man, every time the Jewish listener heard that, their ears would perk up and they would go, Really? Seriously? You're the guy? You're the guy? You're saying you're the one from God? That you're the one from the throne? Just so you know, that the Son of Man has the power to take away sins because only God can take away sins. Just so you know, I'll tell this paralyzed man to get up, pick up his mat, and walk. I have always been, I am now, and I will always be so much more than the Jesus you colored in Sunday school, is what he's saying. So what I want to do is I want to finish this morning kind of sweeping through the book of Revelation. I want to highlight some passages in the book of Revelation that if you ever thought that that lamb petting God was not big enough for your situation, your life situation, your, your personal situation, this is good news this morning, all right? This is good news. John is writing about a vision. All right, he's writing about a vision that he has seen. He, like other disciples, are arrested. They've been tortured. He still believes in Jesus. And this is what he sees, starting in Revelation chapter 19, picking up at verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. What? Have you ever read that and just go, what? How awesome you got to be to have a name that nobody can handle. How awesome do you got to be? He says he's got a name written on him that you can't even understand. Hey, mate, what's your name? You can't handle this, is what he's saying. That's Jesus. See, it goes on. It goes on. But let's pick up again. He is dressed in a robe dripped in blood. His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on a white horse and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I never got to color that in Sunday school. They never gave me that picture. Why didn't they show me that picture of Jesus in Sunday school? That would have been fun to color. Well, i got to remember, I grew up in a little Baptist church, right? You don't do tattoos in Baptist church. So why would you, you know, how do you deal with that Jesus? We'll just ignore that Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, boom, tattooed right there on his thigh, like a big tribal warrior, right? King of kings, Lord of lords, tribal band, something I don't know. And his army is riding with him. And look at how they're dressed. They are dressed in armor and sh no, they are dressed in white linen. What? What? Remember coming home from church as a kid and you immediately want to go out and play with your mates outside. And the first thing you have to do is you have to take off your good Sunday school clothes to put on your play clothes to go outside. Are you going out to play, son? Yeah, well, first, go put on your white linens. What? My parents never said that. They never said, go put on your white linens. Man, if a guy shows up to play touch, and he's wearing white linens, and he's got game to back it up, you know no one's going to touch him. You know that he cannot get touched, let alone get tackled. You show up in white linens to play touch. This army shows up in white linen, because they know they're not getting dirty. They know they don't have to do this fight. Why? Because I'm riding with him. See the guy in the front? 
dripping blood off his robe, sword coming out of his mouth. I'm riding with him. I'm okay in my white linens. I'm with him. Bring it on. Because Jesus is bringing the justice. I don't have to fight this. God's got this. Jesus as man shows us how to walk with God. Beard, lambs, love for us, compassion. That's Jesus as man. That is not who he's always been. The Jesus he refers to 83 different times, that's who he is. That's who he's always been. The son of man is a much bigger deal. Make no mistake, he says, I'm the one who comes rushing in the clouds. I'm the one that comes with thunder and lightning. I'm the one that comes from, will come for all nations and all people and all languages will be under my rule. It's my kingdom that has no limits and has no end. I am, he says, I am 83 times. I am the Son of Man. Now that's a Jesus I could take all my issues to. That's a Jesus that no matter what is going on, no matter how big a problem looks, no matter how political a problem looks, no matter how overwhelming a problem looks, no matter how personal a problem looks, that's a Jesus that no matter the darkness or the problem I'm struggling with, Kind of sounds like the guy in the dripping bloody robe with the sword coming in his mouth on a big white horse. Kind of sounds like he can handle it, right? He's that Jesus. See, growing up, I never had someone say, Brian, do you understand the kind of God you have? No one asked me that growing up as a kid. I didn't. I had a soft, lamb-cuddling, softest felt kind of God. That's all I had. And, and I would love for us to better know that when we pray, picture who you're praying to. I would love us to better understand that when we pray, this is the God we're praying to, not this is the God we're praying to. What kind of God do we worship? What kind of God do we follow? What kind of God do we love and trust and sing praises to? Listen to Revelation 4. Here's a picture of the kind of God we do that to. Revelation 4, starting at the very beginning. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that had shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had to face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You know, the atheists... They'll say there's no throne. There's no heaven. The, the humanists will say, well, there is a throne. I own it. I sit on it and I'm in charge. Either way, there's no more authority. There's no boundaries. There's no right and wrong. There's no help. There's no support. There's no hope. There's no healing. Yet the Bible makes it very clear that there is somebody on the throne. And there is 24-7 worship of that someone by beings who have many, many eyes. So they always pay attention to our Jesus who is on the throne. And 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 angels worshiping that whole time. Let's skip down to chapter 5, starting at verse 56. Then I saw a lamb 
looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons of every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to serve our God and they will reign on this earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped when you pray do you have any idea who's on the other end of that phone call? Is that who you picture? When you go to McDonald's and you pray for your food, because if you're eating McDonald's, you need to pray for that food. <laughs> but if you go to McDonald's and you're praying for your food and you got your Macca's value meal and you say, dear God, thank you for the food and bless it to our bodies. Do you have any clue who you're talking to? Because if we did, it would change everything. Not only would it change how we pray, it would change what we expect after we pray. Hebrews gives us a picture of what it would change. How it would change the way we approach life and problems and conflict and stuff. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God gets it. He knows it all. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows everything you've ever thought. He knows everywhere you've ever been. Nothing is unrevealed to God. Everything we have ever done, thought, said is known by God. And Jesus went to the cross and said, I'll take it. I've got this. Therefore, since that is the Lamb who takes all that stuff on our behalf, we walk with confidence. We walk with boldness. We walk with grace. We walk with forgiveness. It changes everything. It changes how we approach God. When my kids were younger, and I finish preaching, and you know, everybody lines up to say hi to the preacher, and they want to tell the preacher thank you, or they want to correct the preacher where you're wrong. It happens all the time. And so you're there, and there's a line of people that talk to you. What would happen is my kids would come in, they see their dad up front, and they see the big line of people, and they don't care about the line, and they just weave in through everybody, and they run up, and they put their hands up. You're going to watch Brianna do it here. And she's going to run up, she's going to put her hands, and when she comes up to me, I'm going to pick her up, and whoever's talking to me, I'm going to say sorry, but not sorry. This one's mine. And I'm going to pick her up and I'm going to hold her. I'm going to talk to her and then we're going to pick up where we left off. See, that's what happens when you pray. 
When we pray, that's what's happening in heaven. Do you get that? That, that all those 10,000 times, 10,000 times, 10,000 angels are worshiping God and surrounding him. And when we pray, he says, hold on a second. Sorry, but not sorry. This one's mine. Direct access to God. He picks you up. And he says, keep on worshiping. But I got to take care of my, my kid right now. That's what happens when we pray. Do we get that? Are you kidding me? It also changes how we approach ourselves. Now that I know who my father is, and I know how big he is, and how mighty he is, and how, how intimately involved he is, and how much he pays attention to me, and how he'll stop 10,000 times, 10,000 times, 10,000 angels for the sake of my prayer and my issues and my needs, that I know that he is one that cannot and will not ever take his eyes off of me, this has to change who I am. This has to change how I approach myself. Growing up, I grew up in California. And one of the things I would do with my father is we would go up into the mountains and we would do fly fishing in the, in the street, in the creams. Uh, and, and so you got the streams, the creeks, you're fly fishing, but it's rattlesnake infested territory. So when you would go, my dad and we always went with my neighbor, uh, Richard, who lived across the street from us, they would carry a firearm. And in the firearm, they have these little bullets, but they're like little mini shotgun shells and they're called snake shot. So when you shoot, it would spread out a pattern of pellets to, to stop a snake in the time of an of a, of a extreme emergency kind of thing. So we're done fishing for the day, and we're on our way back down, and we're climbing down over rocks and going back down to where he had the truck. And uh, Richard is in the, taking the lead. I'm right behind him. My father's taking the, the back. He's taking he's at the end, end of the line. And as we come over this rock, you're always supposed to look before you step over rocks. We did. Richard jumped over it. So I thought I'd say, so I jumped over it. And as I jumped over it, there was a six-foot rattlesnake right there in the path, coiled, ready to strike. Richard freaks out, pulls his gun, pulls it out, and then pulling it out, knocks me to the ground. So as I hit the ground, my hat goes flying into the stream in a little pool right here. So Richard pulls out his gun, he goes, bam, bam, misses the snake completely because he's panicking forever. He looks at the gun as if it's the gun's fault. He sees my hat in the water, boom, shoots my hat, hits it, it sinks and goes, it's not my gun. All the while I'm on the ground and the snake is like this far from my face ready to strike. My dad sees this. He comes up, he pushes Richard out of sight. He picks me up. And in one moment, he, <laughs> he picks me up, he pulls out his gun. I'm hanging over the edge and I'm watching like this. <laughs> Boom, and shoots the head right off the snake in one shot. He looks at me, he puts me down, and he says, you okay? He goes, yeah. I go, yeah, 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 I'm okay. And he goes, are your pants okay? Because, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. I look at him, I'm like, that's my dad. That is amazing. He's a superhero. He's totally a super, one shot, picks me up, the snake's about to strike, picks me up, shoots him, boom. I look at Rich like, man, you're a Richard. You get in the back of the line. <laughs> so my dad takes the lead. I follow him. We put Richard in the back. That's the God we follow. See, that's how it works. He is much more than a lamb cuddling God. I walk the earth holding the hand of the God of Revelation 5. Nothing can mess with me. No matter what issue, problem, worry I'm facing, nothing can mess with me. God's got this. So then it changes how I approach my problems. Radically. He says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, this is what happens. We do life and, and what happens is life happens and all of a sudden we got this big old bag of worry, right? This big old huge bag of worry. And, and but we know God and sometimes the worry just feels bigger than God. And we know that we got this worry and I'm just, I'm worrying and I don't like it. I don't like what people are doing. I got to tell people and we stay and we start telling our friends and our family all about it and we get angry and we get bitter and we just talk about the worry and talk about the problem and we got to fix it. We got to fix it. We got to fix it. And then, and we're staying up late at night and we can't sleep. And then in a moment of faith, 
in a moment of faith, in a moment of Christian responsibility sometimes, I got to give this to God because we Christians pray. So I take it out and I give it to God, thinking that the worry won't feel so big. I give it to God and I step back. Okay, I got to take it back again because God's taking too long and he's not doing it the way I want and I know the way God's got to fix it. So I'm going to take it back and I'm just going to take this and I'm going to leave. I'm going to walk with my worry because you don't know how to do it. I know how to do it and I'll take care of it. Right? Isn't that how it works? The problem is we need to flip things around. God's bigger than the worry. There's a saying that when Christians lose their mind, People lose their faith. When Christians get all hung up with this stuff and think we got to fix it on our own, we lose our minds. And we make God really small. But the fact is, the worry is not as big as God. We sing songs, cast all our cares onto him, right? The problem with that song is I cast our cares. I'll hang on to my life. I'll cast my cares. But what we're told scripturally is I give my whole life to God through Jesus. This is who wins. Every time, this is who wins. And we've got to remind ourselves that God's a whole lot bigger than our worry. And it's always about Him, not about anything else. Because then it changes. It's that because of the family I've been adopted to, he will squash the snake. He will part the angels and let me run right up to him. He will pick me up. He will take care of my issues. He's on the horse with the dripping road and the sword in the front. I'm the warrior in the back in the white linen knowing I don't have to fight this. He's got this. I'm not even going to get dirty. I have full access to the full power and love and presence and protection of God. He's got this. What we've lost since page three, I think has made us hide. And we hide behind the lie that I'm still that bad person before I met Jesus. And we hide behind the lie that it's still my job to fix the problem, take away the worry. But it changes how we approach those things. Last quick story, a young woman named Larissa was part of my youth group and joined in about midway through high school, year 11. And she went to a party, and while at a party, someone slipped some drugs in her drink, and a group of guys did horrible things and abused her that evening. She kept that a secret, didn't tell anybody. She was one of the ones that came to a youth group, just brought life to the room, and she started to go gray and dark and quiet, started to not show up. We, her small group leaders pursued her. Our female youth pastor pursued her. She just wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And we just kind of lost track of her for two years. And in year 13, she showed up again. Showed up and our youth pastor named Angie met with her and, and, and then said, look, Brian, you need to come in. So I came and met with them. And she tells us a story about what happened on that night and how she had kept this the whole time and how she went down this dark path because of, of the fact that I just deserve it. I'm a terrible person. I'm a terrible person. I was told that I deserved this. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm there, but somewhere in the back of my head, someone, I remember you, Brian, saying something about Jesus and reading some of the Bible that says God's bigger than this, but I don't believe it because I'm a terrible person. So we went through this process of reminding her of what we've just been reminded of just now. And in tears and in crying and in, in, in weeping and wailing, she accepted that she's not that person and God loves her. And then through a whole lot of counseling and a whole lot of process of walking alongside her, helping her re-understand who she is, she is now a counselor, a Christian counselor for high school kids, helping boys and girls that have gone through similar situations not let that define who they are and instead let God define who they are. And she's told me, she goes, because I experienced the grace and mercy of an all-powerful God, I can now give that away. And I want others to know the God that I know. That your life is about God. It's not about me. That your life is free and, and awesome because God is free and awesome. See, that's our God. 
He looks at the marks on his son Jesus and he says, it's all gone. He looks at me and says, you're clean. It's all gone. Whatever you owe me has been paid. You're debt free, he says. You don't need to stand in line, boy. You run right up to the front because we got this kind of special relationship now. You're mine and I'm his. You're a son or a daughter or a prince or the princess of the kingdom. You're an heir to the throne. And that changes everything about Monday through Saturday because we discovered the other Jesus. Please don't forget the God you talk to. Please don't forget who he is when you walk with him. We are Christians. And daily we say, Dad, Abba, Father, help me. Help me to live and be more like you. Because Revelation 5 is real. It's the reality we've been adopted into. So for now on, when you pray, stop, pause for a second, and remind yourself what you've entered into. Spiritually, look around. See the 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 angels to your left, to your right, circling everything around. The four beasts, the 24 elders, all enter in there. Remember, you've entered into that and realize that you are called to be the son or the daughter of God with a Father in heaven who will not, cannot take his eyes off of us, cannot take his eyes off of you, regardless of what's going on. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are indescribable, that you are uncolorable as our Savior and as our Lord, as our King, that you have a name that no one can even fathom, yet we call you Daddy, because you call us our, your kids. Help us that as we face strife and conflict and worry and anxiety, as we worry about our kids and our grandkids, as we worry about our friends and our neighbors, as we worry about finances and health and, and church and life, and that in all of that, remind us that you are God. We are not. That you are bigger than our worry. You are bigger than our problem. And you already know about it. And you already have a plan to fix it because you love us. Because we are prince and princesses of the kingdom. Because we are heirs to the throne on which you sit on and not us. In Jesus' name, amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for your ongoing grace and mercy you bestow upon us daily. We thank you, Lord, that amidst all that we are experiencing currently and all the changes we are facing, that you are our constant, you change not. Yesterday, today, and forever you are the same. Lord, as we come before you today, we ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds to be receptive of what we've heard today. We pray, Lord, that whatever means we have tuned in, Lord, that we'll be open, Lord, to the wing of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray that your word will find the meaning in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your abundance of love, mercy, peace, and grace you usher upon us daily. We commit this time into your hands. We take comfort from your word in Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we live in. We pray for wisdom with our government at present. There are a lot of pieces of conflicting information and we just pray that you'll give those leaders wisdom. We also pray for the leadership of the church and how they handle what's coming up. Lord, I pray particularly for Auckland at the moment. Just they've been in lockdown for a long time and I really feel that they could use your presence, your peace and your wisdom. We pray for all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, if you've been learning about Jesus ever since you were at Sunday school when you were younger, or maybe you've just started learning about Jesus more recently, we've all got a lot that we can learn about Jesus and the lengths that he would go to to save us. Today's service was all about worry. But you know, when we have big worries, 
We've got to remember we've got a big God. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he told his followers to not worry. And you know, this time of night, the birds are starting to sing as they go to bed. And I love the birds. They're going to get up in the morning and they'll be singing again. You know, birds, they don't have income. They don't have sick days. They survive through the winter. And I wonder if we could translate their song into lyrics. Maybe what they are saying is that if God has us, then he's got you. When you subscribe to our YouTube channel, that helps you keep up to date with our latest news. You can find small group questions at our virtual page, www.hebc.nz slash virtual. If you have prayer requests, please forward them on to jlockley at hebc.nz. And remember, all our information on giving can be found at www.hebc.nz slash giving.